Hey everyone, Jeff Bruno, your outsource CFO, coming to you live for Acceleratorsorg.com. <laughs> hey Sean Thomas, how are you man? Just trying to be a little more like you, Sean, you know what I mean? If you're watching this, sorry I was late guys, had to, couldn't get off a call and it was important, you know, it was a sales call. So everybody knows how important that is in, the, in our small, small business world. But I'm back. <laughs> so, and it is, what is it today, Tuesday? Like, still the early part of the week. Let's get through this week. Now, um, hope everybody's doing well today. Um, and of course, if anybody is actually live, uh, throw, throw comments out as you'd like. Um, I'm going to start jumping in right into the questions today. We have a few, not too many, uh, but uh, some, some interesting uh, sh changes on some of these questions. So, Looking forward to today, guys. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, oh, before I jump in, don't forget PPP, the 50,000 level. If, if uh, I'm sure people are checking the news, but it uh, looks like that's essentially f full forgiveness. So get that into your bank um, and get that done. Get that taken care of, please. Um, I'm sure some of your businesses here have had under $50,000 loans. Um, so... Uh, get it out, get it as income, as other income, and um, you know, help help your financials for banking and other purposes for next year. So, uh, so starting now with our first question, it comes from Michael Plyley. This question is: When I'm about to hire someone, how do I calculate all my costs for that hire? His business is uh or he, he says i'm about to hire a salesperson or maybe a technician and i want to calculate all the costs so i understand what it will mean from a cash flow perspective he is in the air conditioning refrigeration company servicing restaurants mainly okay so michael uh i mean this is a uh, frequent question, uh, but also a pretty uh, relatively simple one. I wouldn't get too caught up in in uh, logistics here. Just lay it out. So, for example, is it a salary le salary level or an hourly level to determine what you're doing for the person? Are you going to give them any benefits? Are is there going to be you know, any PTO time, vacation, PTO sick, all that kind of thing. Um, holidays off, paid holidays. You got to factor all that into into your cost calculation for the year. And then when you're looking at this person, assuming they're a technician, um, so what would that be? What would that technician be from a direct level? Meaning, if they have 20... 2,080 hours a year of full-time work, how much of that time do you expect them to actually be on jobs versus driving to the job, doing paperwork, looking at a proposal, things like that? Because you want to factor that into the actual scenario for your business. So if they're 60% uh, utilized or 70% utilized, whatever that may be, that is a factor into your cost calculation. Um, of how much work they can actually do. Um, and then you want to look at benefits. Uh, you know, are you going to provide medical for them, single or for a, uh, you know, a group plan for family if they're interested? Uh, are you going to have ancillary benefits, maybe volunteer benefits? Are you going to have small things like life insurance, disability coverages? Um, these are all things that a small business doesn't dive too much into, but can be additive. Uh, for attracting talent, depending on what industry you're in. So what about 401k or a simple IRA or something for retirement so people can put some tax-deferred monies to work? All of these things are, you, are items you can, should consider. But to dumb it down for you here, and I mean that in a nice way, I like to say you're generally between 1.16 and 1.25 times your salary to get a benefit scenario packaged together. So as an example, if you have an employee you're paying $50,000, you could assume at 1.2, it's gonna cost you about $60,000 annually for that employee. 
between payroll taxes your company has to pay at about 8.9%. Um, 9% we like to use as an average, depending on unemployment in your state, and other things, uh, benefits, it comes to typically 20%. Could be higher, could be a little lower. Um, so use that as a gauge. That's the best I could tell you for the moment. Hope that was helpful. Um, so next submitter is Eric Blandino. Eric says, I love the idea of doing something fun with our team for two hours during work time once a month in the form of leadership games, escape room, etc. Is this something to be done monthly, bi-monthly, or quarterly? We are a rat exclusion service company and our techs mostly work in the field independently. There are times we work together on larger projects. I am asking this because I want the techs to learn, bond, and have fun, but not lose the lessons that are being discovered on how to work with each other by the games, if too frequent or not. So, um, Eric, so this really comes to, I mean, there's not, there's not too much financial question here in the sense of, I mean, I wouldn't be spending, you know, $20,000 a year on fun and games uh, for your team as a small under 1 million, sub 1 million company. But, you know, $2,000, $5,000 maybe if you really want to keep them, at, you know, energized and motivated and so on. Sure, absolutely. Put that in a budget. But what it comes down to here is the culture and dynamics of your company. What do you want to do? How do you want to, is it important that your techs and your people who are going out to do the mostly field work um, could benefit by being together? I mean, is there a productivity thing here that could help? Like, oh, John, you did it this way or, you know. Harry, uh, you did it that way and it's faster, same as some time. I could do four appointments a day versus three. Um, or, you know, hey, could, maybe there's a, a, a group software collaboration tool you can use where they could cover each other if one guy's sick or one guy has to go do something personal or, or there's something else going on. They could cover for each other. And if they know each other well and they know the other guy's going to do the work right and, and help them, um, then that group dynamics can be helpful. Um, I mean, ultimately, I think it does lead to a good culture and it does lead to better productivity by having these things. I would recommend maybe every other month instead of monthly. Could get a, could, could get a little bit um, almost, it could be hard to be creative if you do it every month. So just be careful with people getting bored with it. Um, and also, you might want to... Um, uh, consider you might want to consider uh, happy hours too. I mean, people just like having some food, maybe a drink or two, uh, beer or something to relax at the end of the day. Uh, that's something to do um, if it works in their schedules. So um, I find that that tends to tends to work and tends to get some get them saying some things that they might otherwise not say. <laughs> so. Um, but the idea is to definitely move your business forward from a productivity level. So hopefully that helps. Next question is from Lisa Filter. Lisa asks, what percent of your dollars should be spent on advertising for a small retail business? And how can I look at it from a budgeting perspective? We own a bridal store in a highly competitive market, one of 40 within 45 minutes drive of each other. Google, then Facebook and Instagram are the best ways to reach new brides. While we have a niche and differentiate, our views are the best. Or, excuse me, our reviews are the best. They are still going to three to five stores on average, some even more. How to curve them to come to one and be done? So Lisa, your question about advertising spend is a un is is an interesting one. Let me let me be very clear here. Um, so you should always budget for advertising. Okay, always put it in your budget. But advertising as a whole bucket is very, very unique. So I would never, ever, ever tell you never. And whoever does is telling you the wrong thing, in my opinion. 
If you're a small business sub 1 million or even sub 500,000, a percentage of your spend could make absolutely no sense. So if you look at industry of bridal locations or sales, and let's say it's a David's Bridal, for example, they're actually out of business now, but they for a while were doing well, and they had, I don't know, 50 locations. I don't know how many they had. They had a bunch of locations. Um, now that can go against some industry norms, and you can budget percentage of your annual revenues for an advertising budget. In your case being so small, let me give you an example. So you might have to penetrate a market like you're saying, you might have to differentiate yourself. And that CAC or cost to acquire a customer could be higher due to competition, as you duly noted, or just be the space itself you're in could deserve that. The, the cost could be high. So to say that you're going to do 10% of your revenue, and let's say you're doing a million dollars, that's a $100,000 spend. That's kind of an erroneous number. What does that mean? What is that? What do those dollars really mean? So, the other thing to consider, which sometimes people forget, is if you have a location, that location can really be a critical um, factor in your advertising. So. Uh, we have recommended at times that people who have a uh, like a, a retail operation like you should consider their location as part of their advertising because without a location they'd be doing it all online uh, and spending a lot more there so we'd like to lump that into your advertising budget even though it's your occupancy cost or your rent or whatever that is but we like to lump that in and then look at a percentage but still for you that's small it's hard to do that so um what I would do is I would do some market research and figure out what are the demands that the women, and in some cases men in this scenario, they might be pushing the women on decisions or driving, driving, uh, or perhaps there's a LGBT contingent uh, that could be in your area. Um, you wanna market to those effectively and bring them to your store so and convert them. So you said you're differentiating yourself so i would ask what how are you doing that um i was pretty amazed where you said you have 40 options within 45 minutes that is massive you must be in a a pretty heavily dent, uh, populated area um but i would ask how do you differentiate yourself i mean what comes to my mind is and now uh, me being married and uh three kids is i would think well if my, um, let's say my uh, significant other or soon to be significant other was coming and I had a brother or people who were coming or friends who were coming to help the, the, the decision making, I'd want to have some things at, or moms or dads, I want to have some things at the bridal location that could help occupy these people and be very service oriented. So I mean, you know, maybe, um, you know, the friends have to bring kids because they can't leave the kids alone. So maybe you have some video games for the, the kids to play off in the corner while you're spending time sitting through these dresses and that sucks people in and keeps them there, you know, because their kids are occupied, the friends' kids. Or maybe you want to have, you know, uh, ways to advertise to the men too, to help them push the wives to the store because they like that store better and they, they like having a beer at your location. And I hate this second time I'm using alcohol, but, you know, when I go to a salon, a hair salon, I have a choice of beer when I get there. I'm getting my hair cut. That's great stuff. People love that. And you get a beer or wine for people to relax while they're choosing their, their dresses. Um, so I think if you emphasize in your marketing experience, You'd be surprised how that can be almost viral, dragging in people uh, to your location versus the others, especially with all the competition. So, but here's the key to this as well. Track, 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 metrics, metric, metric. What are the metrics you're looking for? If you spend $10,000 on advertising, how much do you need in sales? 50,000, 100,000? What is that metric? 
How much margin do you have? I'm going to talk about that a little bit later too, but that's a determiner on how much advertising you want to spend as well. So you got to see if it works, if you see an uptick due to that, and if it's effective. You can even look at engagement on, on some of the sites to see if you're getting higher engagement from people clicking and this and sharing and so on when you have experiences out there on your marketing. So sorry if I didn't give you a, a, a tight, specific financial example, but just doing a percentage of a budget is not a smart thing as a small business. So it's a little bit of gut, a little bit of differentiation, and make sure you track where you're going with those metrics. Hope that was helpful. Next question, Joe Nugent. Joe's business, he owns a home inspection and home watch company in Naples, Florida. He works with people um, buying a home to inspect it prior to closing to ensure that the home is safe and all systems and components are working properly. Um, I also work with seasonal residents to look after their slice of paradise. <laughs> His question, in my projected P&L and cash flow statement, how can I understand the effect when hiring a salesperson that is going to have um, with a base plus commission compensation? So. Joe, um, so let's let's dive into this. So, in your market, okay, what do you need? Let me repeat that. In your market, Joe, what do you need? Is it a volume game? Is it an easy sell? Is it just contact sport? As many contacts as you can get going. Is it a sophisticated sale? Meaning, do you need experienced people in that industry to be able to say, well, I uh, came in your house and I saw that that, I mean, again, I'm making this up. I saw that your, your, a couple of your plugs were a little bit cracked and, you know, I saw that uh, your, your window security uh, pieces were, were not working correctly as with a quick little uh, jump through your house. You know, we could fix that all up for you. Um, before you buy it or for the summer when you're away, um, things like that. So do they need to know that? Or can they easily be trained by that? Or is it just slog in the contacts to get, to get that there and pushing that off to someone else to close it like yourself? So there's a lot of determining on how you uh, were to bring that person in for that that scenario and then the question the second question is do you want a hunter or a farmer so a hunter is someone who essentially is given a phone book that says go get it and they go out and they create a whole market for you and bring in all these new sales and there's a farmer who you might have some more leads and warm leads or some good connections that can feed them sort of teed up leads that are not necessarily going to close but that the farmer can farm them and bring them to harvest. So um, what are you looking for? Because those are different pay scales, usually. Um, so let me let me differentiate that a little bit. So a hunter will think, we'll have a mindset, I'm gonna go after it, I'm gonna crush it, I'm gonna bring in more sales that this than this owner knows what to do with, and for that, I'm gonna get compensated well. So that usually means a higher commission model and a lower base, maybe a two thousand a month base and a fifteen percent commission on sales. I'm, again, I'm just making numbers up um, here. But whereas maybe a more farmer type person would say, "Well, I'm good at farming this stuff, but I'm just not a phone book, you know, run around the town kind of guy or gal." So yeah, I'd, I'd like to have fifty thousand base. Um, and yeah, I'm good with 5% commission on, on sales that close. This will help you determine your structure. Um, all of this then needs to be budgeted, meaning sometimes people will put a commission component up in like the variable expenses of a, um, I mean, excuse me, in the COGS or the, or the uh, direct cost with a, with a sale, but it really isn't. It is a variable expense, but it has nothing to do with the COGS of your business. So you should budget for what you think that amount is. Now let's talk about that. So depending on the person, okay, 
like a hunter or a uh, farmer or so on. And depending on your margin is going to also help you depend on what type of person you need to bring in there. So if you tell me that on your products, your margin is, on your sales of your service, your margin is 50%. The tech goes out, does this, you come in, you fix things, the products are this, and due to your pricing, you're at about a 50% margin. So for every $5,000 job, you're getting 2,500 bucks in gross profit. If that's the case, okay, then you can start to set up goals or quotas for your salesperson. Let me give you an example. If you bring in a $50,000 all-in compensation salesperson, let's say it's $2,000 a month for, um, Space and twenty six thousand in commission. That's fifty thousand. So, in a fifty percent margin business, you might say to them, "Hey, you need to do two hundred fifty thousand in sales. That's your quota, because that would mean one hundred twenty five thousand of that is actually profit to you, of which you're paying fifty thousand out to that person. So you're netting seventy five thousand dollars for your business. That is moving your business forward." That is giving you an effective 30% profit rate on your business, which is probably where you want to target. Maybe 20, 20, 30%. That's probably a, a ballpark of where you want to be um, on that. And well, let's assume there's some other fixed costs, so maybe you're at 20%, but that's ballpark of where you want to be. So you would put that target in place for them and then pay them accordingly. So really, you're talking about that person being about five times their compensation in sales volume. Now let's say you're tighter margins. Let's say you're a 25% margin and it's really more of a volume game. Maybe you want to tilt a little bit more towards a commission model because really you need higher volume because you need that person to do 500,000 in sales to get you the same 125 in net and GP because you're at a 25 margin. So, and that would then, then being 50,000 in, in construct there to get you to about the same profit, 50,000 in pay. So, yes, that's a higher sales level, but in theory, they could, if they did a mi like they did a million, they might make 120,000 because they're just, their commission's higher. So they might be more intrigued by doing that than the other way I, I just told you. Now I'm jumping around a little bit here, Joe, but this is a great topic. And I think it really depends on what you're selling, what you're looking for, what your structure is with your you know, network, and what you're doing in the, in the marketplace margin-wise. So a lot of things to consider. Very cool topic, by the way. Um, so next, <clears throat> excuse me, next is Tim Schiffer. Tim owns and operates an e-commerce outdoor retail store focused on hiking, camping, and backpacking. We've been around for 2.5 years and are experiencing steady but not yet explosive growth. Brick and mortar has been a desire of mine since the beginning. The business started and uh, since the business started, and was in our three to five year business plan. So we feel people are disconnected from the out outdoors. They're inside all day. Yeah, like me sitting here. <laughs> under a bad fluorescent light bulb staring at a screen that's giving off blue light we should help people uh, we should tell people help people how to live better uh, more complete life by getting them into the outdoors so my his question is what are your thoughts on opening a physical retail location in this environment when the trend is going away from that Tim first off love the concept I'm sure that's been more popular in the last uh, five years or so, um, but I love the concept. Um, are you in a warm weather location? Because that certainly gives you more availability for year round there, um, which is an important factor. But um, so I would just be very straightforward and ask you this. Tim, what is the point of your brick and mortar? And I don't mean that in a condescending or aggressive manner. What I mean is, truly, what is the point of your brick and mortar? If it's to sell product for your hiking and camping and so on, I would find it very difficult. Now, this is my opinion, 
but not knowing your business space that well, but I would find that difficult to be a reason a reason to open a brick and mortar location if you're just selling product from your location. So if, however, you see that as another way for you to grow, let me be very specific. You see it as a key differentiator for you to advertise your situation. And this could be very important on what you're advertising. So maybe that you want to reach beginner campers. Maybe you want to work in corporations for executive getaways, okay? Maybe you want to um, just be a resource for people to understand what they're trying to do, or, or, like how to get outside and experience some of this stuff. So maybe there are training sessions. Maybe there are best practices. Uh, like. I'm not a huge camper. I mean, I've done it when I was younger and so on. Not a huge hiker. But if I went somewhere and I did two hours, maybe three hours, someone showed me how to do a column and lantern, gave me some tips on how to start fires, said, here's how you set up a tent. Uh, you know, you got to be careful of this, 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 and this when you're hiking. Um, wear these clothes. You can get them here if you want, or you can order them online on Amazon. Here's our... You know, here's our Amazon link. Um, all of that would be helpful to me, and I would pay for that. Now, I wouldn't pay $150, but I might pay 40 bucks to come down and learn about that stuff. Um, and that might be a strong angle for you to have a brick and mortar place so that you can have the stuff there if people wanna buy it when they're on site, but you don't have to store a lot, so you don't have to buy a ton of inventory. You can have it at your manufacturer or store it online at Amazon or somewhere. And you can use your space to advertise, train, and entice people about what you're trying to sell, which is really that outdoor experience. I love it. And if it was near me, I would certainly jump on jump over there and and Maybe even bring my kids and say, "Kids, come on, we'll do you know do an hour over there. He'll show you how to work these lanterns and this, and set up a tent." So that's where I would go with that. Um, but of course, you know that's up to what your goal is here. Um, so, but if it was just to sell product, again, I would say don't do it. Don't do it. Um, so, one last question. And this is from Sean Thomas. Hey, Sean, thanks for throwing a question in here, man. If you're still watching, probably not. <laughs> so, Sean says, without a team to, de to delegate to and without the budget to hire a full team, how did you get things done when you first started your company and it was just you? The background is I hear many experienced entrepreneurs talk about delegating and only doing the things you are great at. And unfortunately, it's only me and I am just starting. So they don't have the team nor the money to hire a full team. I know I can't be alone in trying to understand how to get everything done on a limited budget. And it is only me. How did you do it when you were first starting? Is it just a mindset? Or where did you go to learn everything to get everything done? Sure. So... Sean, I love that question, of course. And here's the deal. Mindset is huge. You're an entrepreneur, Sean. You started this this group, and uh, obviously I love being part of it here. Um, but mindset's really important. Um, drive, of course, is really important. Entrepreneurs are typically very driven, so not usually the biggest issue there. Um, and really surrounding yourself with consistent feedback. So here's the thing. Don't ever forget this. People love to give feedback. Look what I'm doing. I'm on here taking my time to help this organization monthly. I don't mind it. I find it intriguing. I like the questions. It gets me thinking too, so it helps me. Um, and um, you know, I love giving people information that can help them. So most people do. So as you're doing your business, don't get stuck 
excuse me, don't get stuck in something. Look for feedback. Maybe you have to take people out to lunch or buy them a cup of coffee um, or, you know, do a happy hour Zoom until we get out of this COVID thing. <laughs> but, you know, people will be willing to give you advice as long as you're genuine and honest with them about where you're headed. So to give you my story, when I first started my business in March of 2013, a whole year and a half before that, I was t taking my hypotheses of the structure I wanted to do in my service business and asking tons of people while I was still working on my sort of off time or lunch time, I would go out with people and say, here's what I'm thinking, what do you think? Give me honest feedback, I haven't done it yet. Here's, wh here's where I wanna go, here's my experience, this makes sense, does this resonate with you as a professional, as a business owner? Would you be interested in these services? And I did that for a full year and a half as I continued to then at the same time build up my network again. So because I was working for a firm for a while, I sort of let my network fall, fall apart and so I needed to build it back up. So I was doing that, I was building my network back up. And then I plopped myself down in a co-working space that I paid $99 a month for and I could go in sporadically when desks were available. I think I was allowed to go there kind of uh, once a week or so. So I'd go there once a week, network with people, um, get a feel, make some calls, um, pull together my models on how I wanted to do things and just have a good space to connect and think through things. And then I ratcheted up that as I needed more space to work. Um, and I really was dogmatic though about you know, I need to get this. I put metrics together. My first year, I remember saying, I want to have five clients by the end of the year. This was March. I wanted to have five clients by December. So I had five clients by January. I'd say that's on target. Um, so I hit my goal. I then said I wanted to have nine clients by late spring. I think it was March or April even. I got to nine clients. I then said, okay, I'm over my head. I'm gonna hire a person. Now, am I, was I ready to hire somebody? No way. But I went out, I stepped outside of bound, my, my normal scenario and said, all right, I'm gonna have to eat some of this money, this profit, I'm not gonna make that much at eight or nine clients, but I have to hire somebody if I wanna get to 15 clients or 20 clients. So I bought the, bought the bullet, hired a guy, young guy, and he was incredible. And uh, we sort of partnered up a little bit on it and made a go at it. And uh, it was, it worked. So, I mean, now seven years later, we're nine people um, and growing. So it's, uh, it takes a lot of uh, fortuitousness and continually staying on top of it. But the key pieces are um, get feedback, and stay on top of your network and, and people will help you. Um, but as far as delegating to a team, I don't recommend that, especially if it's a new idea and you're just trying to get it, make sure that you, you see that it works and you have some successful engagements before you um, bring on team members that can quickly be disenfranchised with things that don't work. That can be your biggest mistake because it could drain your funds real fast. So take your time. I spent a good year before I brought in my first employee. And uh, um, so you can do it. That's, that's my story, Sean. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so, uh, but hopefully that was helpful today. And uh, everybody... Uh, you know, feel free again to hit me up on comments or Jeff at YoCFO.com is my email and uh, look forward to every month for this. So we'll be chatting soon again. Thanks. Bye.